Mark chapter 15 again. It's our second dive into this chapter. We looked at the first 15 verses last week. But with no exaggeration, we're looking at the most important day in human history. We're looking at the most important day in all of our lives that are sitting here today. And here's the crazy thing. None of us were even alive when it happened. It's the most important day of our lives, but we weren't even alive when it happened. And that, of course, is the crucifixion of our Lord. And this is the thing. It, it's one of those subjects that's very heavy. And when you study it out, if you look at it, and remember last week I challenged us to look at the events surrounding the crucifixion with fresh spiritual glasses, with, uh, with a newness. Look at them for the first time again, if that makes sense. Because every time we look at the cross, we need to just be in awe of what our king did for us. And I want us to really let that sink in, what he did for us. And so I want to challenge us again today and understand we're going to be looking at just the first part of the crucifixion. We'll be looking at the scourging and our Lord beginning to carry his cross up that hill called Golgotha, Calvary. Um, and we're going to be looking at that. And next week we will look at the crucifixion some more because I think it requires more than just one teaching. And then we'll also look at the beautiful resurrection which in that, there's a beautiful promise for us. But even in today's lesson, there's a lot of beauty and a lot of promises for you and I. But I want us to take that serious today. And I also want us to be reminded, you know, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that our Lord, our King, our God, our Savior, our friend, Jesus, went to the cross willingly, but also joyfully. Do you understand that? He went there despising the shame, but he went there because he knew what it meant for you. And he knew what it meant for me. And he knew what it meant for the Father to do his will. He knew what it meant for all of us. It is the greatest day in, in human history for all of us. And so he knew that. And so he went to the cross. And today, as we reflect on that, I want to start with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Because I think this is a good reminder to tell us of why our Lord went to the cross and that he did it joyfully for you and I. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says this, Therefore we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so in this passage, a couple things. Um, the first thing is, this is how you and I are to walk out our Christian life. We need that endurance, the same endurance that our Lord showed. But it also tells us to lay aside every weight, every sin that easily ensnares us. And especially in these days we live, it's, it's past time to be serious about your faith. It's, it's past time to pay attention and to be saturated with the things of the world. We don't have a lot of time left on this planet. And here's the thing. People always say, well, you've been saying that for years, talking about the rapture. But I also know every person in this, in this room will at some point have a personal rapture if, if we're not raptured. And life is short. Life doesn't last very long. When you're younger, you think it does. And then you get a little older and you're like, where did it go? It's gone. Life, we're a vapor. We're here, we're gone. And so be challenged in that. But also understand it's not easy. This life isn't easy. I think we all can attest to that. It requires the same endurance that Jesus showed us. He is the perfect example. We follow his example. And he showed that he had that endurance. And that's what we have to have. Now, Barclay in his commentary writes, endurance translated here is the ancient Greek word hupomone, which does not mean the patience which sits down and accepts things, but the patience which masters them. It is a determination, unhurrying and yet undelaying, which goes steadily on and refuses to be deflected. Our Lord was not deflected from the cross. He had the endurance to go right up that hill. And you and I as a Christian, we are supposed to walk in that same endurance. And it's not this just passive relationship. The Christian life requires actively serving. Actively studying, actively praying, seeking, loving, fellowshipping. It's an active relationship. It requires endurance. Nobody told you it'd be easy. The Lord only told you it'd be worth it. <laughs> and it will be very worth it. Just as the cross was worth it to all of us. And in verse 2 of Hebrews 12, it tells us the key to being able to walk this Christian life. To walk it out. 
Because we know we're looking to who? Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Lord is the one writing our story, and so we have to look to him. We look to him and we look to his example of endurance, and we look to him for everything that we need. We're also going to look at a picture later on in this teaching of another helper, the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us to walk out true Christian life. And we need that kind of, that kind of leading and that kind of endurance. And so let us follow his example. But also know this, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting there until when, church? Until the Father tells the Son, go get your, pri your bride, go get her, it's ready. The place you've been building and making for her, if you know anything about the, the Galilean wedding tradition, the, the husband, the, the bridegroom would build this room onto the father's house. And once the construction was done and the father thought it was time to go get the bride, he would do this. But it was only the father who knew the day or the hour. And once the construction was done, he would send his son and say, go get your bride. And so we know our king is sitting at the right hand of the father, waiting for the command to go get his bride. And so endurance, when we're thinking about endurance, that should help us endure. Because we know the Lord looked past the shame of the cross. He looked past all of that for the joy that was set before him. And that joy was you and me. And you and I, we're going to have difficulty in this life, but we have to look past it to the joy that's set before us. Get eternal eyes, get eternal glasses. Look past the garbage and the clutter of this world and this life. It's all decaying, it's all dying, it's all going to burn. But your future is bright. You have hope. You have an eternity in heaven with a king that you're going to worship and love on forever. And so keep this in mind as we study about the cross and about everything our Lord went through for us, for you. Do you understand that? He went through this for you. And so with that in mind, Mark chapter 15, I'm going to actually cover a verse we covered last week because last week I only covered the first half of it. I'll cover more of the second half of that verse, but verse 15 through 22, that's our text today. Mark 15, so Pilate, verse 15, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off, of, off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. Father, this is your word. And we know that your word changes us from the inside out. And God, right now we invite you to change us. We invite you to help us to have spiritual glasses, spiritual eyes to see, and have spiritual ears to hear your truth, to hear what you will say to your church. Lord, these are your people. Speak to them through your word. Help me to get out of the way and pour out your spirit upon each one of us, that we would be renewed, that we'd be refreshed, that we would be reminded what you did for us. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so last week, though, we looked at the first part of that verse where we see this exchange being made between Barabbas, Baraba and Jesus, Yeshua. And I talked about that a little bit, and it's just fascinating when you look at this and you search it out. If you weren't here, um, the name Barabbas, that's his last name, and it means son of the father, but Barabbas' first name was Yeshua. It was Jesus. And so this amazing exchange that's going on is between Jesus, the son of the father, and then our Lord Jesus, the son of the heavenly father. And there's this beautiful exchange made, and understand Barabbas is a picture and a type of me and you. That's the exchange that's being made. And we know that the crowd was stirred up, manipulation by the high priest, and they chose Barabbas over Jesus. And we know that um, Pilate gave in to this. He gave in to this because of pressure, and he ordered Jesus crucified. However, I just want to say something, because this came up in conversations this week. You know, Pilate had a choice in the matter. Do you understand that? 
God doesn't force anyone to sin. Pilate had a choice in the matter. If Pilate would have said, I'm not going to do it, he would have lost his head, as we'll find out. But God would have found another way to make it happen. Do you understand that? Pilate is not um, negated of responsibility. He had a choice in the matter. Judas, believe it or not, had a choice in the matter. If Judas wouldn't have betrayed the Lord, someone else would have. Scripture would have been fulfilled. But Judas had a choice. Judas had a choice. Pilate had a choice. Here's the thing, though. As Pilate is going to command Jesus to be crucified, as the command, the edict goes out, we know that Judas is then going to meet his end. In Matthew 27, verse 3 through 5, we find out right at the same time period when, when Pilate condemns Jesus to be crucified, Judas then does this, verse 3 in Matthew 27, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And people say, well, see, you know, Judas, he was remorseful. But I tell you right now, this was not true godly remorse. This was not godly sorrow. And how do we know? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, look at this. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. How do we know this was the sorrow of the world? G Judas killed himself. Judas was remorseful. He was sorrowful, but it was his own flesh. It was worldly sorrow. It wasn't godly sorrow. We know Judas is called the son of perdition. We know where Judas is at. But understand, Judas had a choice in the matter. Judas had a choice in the matter. His sorrow was selfish. True repentance brings about changed heart. And changed heart brings about changed behavior. Do you understand that? I think we all know the difference between true repentance and, oh, I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> I'm a little remorseful because I, I lost something personally or somebody doesn't like me now. There's a big difference. But that sorrow that, that Judas has was definitely worldly. He tried to take care of his own guilt. There's another lesson. We can't take care of our own guilt. We got to go to Jesus. Judas had every opportunity. Along the way, Jesus offered several opportunities for Judas to repent. Judas never repented. He never just said, I'm sorry, Lord. Remember this. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Even Judas, even me, even you. That's how much he loves all of us, for he so loved the world. That's what this cross of Calvary is all about. And all of us have a choice. And we know this. We know the priests didn't care about all this. We know that they, the, they bought a field with the money. They took it, and it's called the field of blood, according to Matthew 27, 8. And then we find out that this also fulfilled a prophecy that's in Zechariah and Jeremiah. Matthew 27, 9 through 10. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for a potter's field and the Lord directed me as the Lord directed me. So just understand this is a prophecy in scripture in Zechariah. This is almost verbatim in Zechariah. And some people say this is a contradiction in scripture. And I'll just touch on this quickly. It's not anything to get too caught up in because it's easy to explain. But often when you're talking to people about about scripture or things like that, and they are, they're, they're cynics and they don't believe in the Bible, they'll say, this is one of those contradictions. This doesn't make sense because he's obviously quoting something almost verbatim out of the book of Zechariah, and he's given Jeremiah credit for it. Matthew's wrong, therefore the Bible's wrong. That's, that's what the argument is. Okay, I won't go into the rules of logic and all these other things again, but just in general study, understand this. When you study out the book of Jeremiah, there are four passages that when you put them together, they give us this prophecy in, in, in complete detail. The issue is Zechariah lived after Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a much more well-known prophet, highly respected in Israel. He's one of the major prophets. And Jeremiah, they all understood this to be true. Zechariah is paraphrasing Jeremiah. And so when he says in this passage that this is what was spoken of of the prophet Jeremiah, that's what he's doing. He's pointing to the original 
the oldest text and the more popular, bigger, you know, name, Jeremiah. It's not a contradiction of scripture. It's all it takes is a little bit of study. And this is what I've told you before. The Bible is so profound and so amazing. Every time somebody's told me there's a contradiction in scripture, I've gone and studied it and all it's done is strengthen my faith in the scripture. That's all it's ever done. But back in our passage today in verse 15, we're now seeing Jesus beaten or scourged. Mark 15, 15 again. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. So we see that Jesus, before his crucifixion, is beaten mercilessly. And we know it's called scourging or flogging. Now, it's called a... a flagellum or a flagrum. This is what the Romans use. I think most of us know kind of what this is. These are long strips of leather with knots in them, with zinc or copper or iron within the knots. They also sometimes use bone or a combination of such. And they were tied into this whip that they would use. And it was, it was created to really take the skin off of the, the person who was being beaten. But it wasn't enough for the Romans. You know what else they did? They put little hooks in the end of these things, and they called it the scorpion for good reason. So there were these little metal hooks at the end of each one of those leather thongs, and they were full of bone and metal pieces, and they were designed to basically create large gashes in the body, in the back, the legs, the side, exposing the muscle, causing severe bleeding. It's hard to even really think about and talk about but we know also the, the Jews had a rule about these whippings um, that they were merciful. So they would always say it was 40 minus one lash, 39 lashes. But the Romans had no such, such rule. They were cruel and bitter. They were heartless. These were wicked men. These armies of Rome did atrocious things beyond anything you could really want to ever think about. But historical accounts from Cicero, the famous Roman orator, he talks about this and he says, this kind of punishment was saved for the very lowest of the slaves. And he he said it was the cruelest and most disgusting penalty. And then not only that, we know that uh, Josephus called it the most pitiable of deaths because often the people who were scourged would die just from the beating. Because understand, it's exposing all that tissue, all that muscle, all that blood. And so if they were weakened in any state, they would collapse under that. And often they died. And I just want to read to you something. In C. Truman Davis' work, The Crucifixion of Jesus Christ, The Passion of the Christ from a Medical Point of View, we read this. The heavy whip is brought down with full force again and again across Jesus' shoulders, backs and legs, or back and legs. At first, the heavy thongs cut through the skin only. Then, as the blows continued, they cut deeper into the subcutaneous tissues, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. Finally, the skin of the back is hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. And, you know, I don't read those things just to, to shock people. There's much more I could share in these things, and I just won't. But when you just think about just the scourging, just what our Lord went through, remember, he's doing this for you and me. He's doing this for us, for the joy (laughs) that was set before him. That's how much we mean to him. And I think about that, but, you know, you ask yourself, well, why? Why did he have to be beaten like this? And I tell you, because Scripture said so. We know this is part of the prophecy. Isaiah 53 Verses 4 through 6 says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's our fault. He's doing this because of us. He's doing this because of you and me, because of everyone who's ever existed and our sin. And, you know, I've, I've, used, I've heard this verse used, and you have too, and I'm not, I'm not complaining or I'm going to tell people they're in heresy because they use it this way. But understand, when it says here that by his stripes we are healed, this is spiritual in context. This isn't physical in nature. This isn't talking about physical healing. But I want to stop there and just say this. The Lord still heals people. <laughs> we're still called to pray for people. Um, we're still called to pray for healing. And God heals people according to his will. 
That still happens. But in the context here, it's actually talking about something much greater. It's talking about our spiritual healing, the remedy that he's given us. It clearly tells us in that passage that this was done for our transgressions. And even though it says that he, he had borne our griefs, that word for griefs is ailment or, or um, sickness. That sickness in the context is our sin. It's our sin. Understand the word there used for um, uh, transgression is pesha in the Hebrew. It means our sin, literally. It means a moral revolt or rebellion. That's man's condition before the blood of Christ. We were in revolt. We were in rebellion. Not only that, but then it says he was bruised for our iniquities. Understand, ovav in Hebrew, it means perversity. It means evil or fault. It's a different way. It's not just our sin. It's all the perverse things. It's everything else. It's all the twisted thinking. It's everything in the human condition in, their, in our sinful state. It just continues on. And we understand this. It then says that it, it says that we were healed, and that word is rafa, it means to cure. But understand this, what it says. It says that the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And that word for peace is shalom. And we know that word. But understand, I've said this before, and it's one of my favorite things to understand, is that Jesus Christ signed a peace treaty in his blood. Because you and I, human beings, all human beings, were the enemy of God prior to the cross. We were at enmity with God. His wrath was being stored up. And what the cross provided was an outlet for God's wrath, which we'll find out next week. God poured out his wrath upon our Savior. That is when the Lord cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment of darkness, there's something we can't comprehend. All the physical things, all the physical beatings and everything that our Lord went through are secondary, and I would say quite a second to the spiritual agony that our King experienced on the cross. When the Father turned from Him, when the Father poured out His wrath, all of the sin that all of us have ever committed, when He poured that out on Jesus, because His blood is sufficient for all sin. And yet... He went there willingly for the joy that was set before him. And when you just ponder that, when you just think about it, and even the context here, when we understand that Jesus, by his stripes we are healed, that's just one part of a bigger context here. This is all about spiritual things in nature. This is all about our fallen nature because in verse 6 of Isaiah 53 it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so clearly this is all about the spiritual depravity of man, our condition. And our king gave us the remedy. He gave us the cure. See, the gospel is good news. It's very good news because there's extremely bad news. That every human being from Adam on was born with the SIN virus. We were all SIN positive. And there was no remedy, there was no cure until the cross of Calvary. Do you understand? We had no future, we had no hope until the greatest day of our lives, which we weren't even alive for. When Yeshua, our King, went up the summit of Golgotha and took your punishment and mine. It's a beautiful thing that he did indeed sign a peace treaty in his blood and he made a way back to the Father. He made a way back for you and I to the king. And that is the greatest gift any of us could ever receive, is salvation. And it's the greatest healing ever known to man. It's what he did for all of us. And so we see Jesus is beaten, and we see these deep lashes and cuts in his back, and we know the Romans have no mercy, they have no compassion, and then we see they continue to mock him. Verse 16, then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed, and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And so we see he's, he's in the Praetorium. And remember, I, I've talked about it a little bit, but the Praetorium was the military headquarters. But understand, it was... It was in the midst of a giant palace that Herod had created, that Herod had built. And there's this inner court where most likely Jesus was scourged.
But this was a giant palace, and there were enough rooms where 100 people could sleep comfortably. This is where Pilate made his office. This is where the troops were there. And it's called the Praetorium because that's where the Praetorian Guard was. This is some a special elite fighting force. I'll come back to that in, in a little bit. But this was a giant palace, a lot of luxury, and in the middle was this inner court. And it's quite a contrast between all this luxury and then these beatings that would go on in this inner court. And of course, the soldiers were next door, but a lot of them worked in the Praetorium in this whole area. We know there was a cohort assigned to that was 600 soldiers. And we're going to see that they call together this, this group, the whole garrison. So whoever was on duty that day, probably two to 300 soldiers are part of this mocking of Jesus. They're celebratory in nature. They're like, all right, we get to mock this criminal. We get, to, we get to do all these things and mock him. Just think about that for a second. Stop and think about what's happening. Many of these soldiers have no idea that this is the king, the creator of the universe. They have no idea. They have no idea what they're doing. And yet we know he willingly subjected himself to these weak and wicked men and all their mockery. And you know, this stuff still goes on today, don't you know? <laughs> I was talking to somebody about the, you guys heard me talk about this, but we get a lot of YouTube comments on the teachings and things like that. And I keep them private <laughs> for good reason. If I ever let them go public, you guys would know immediately why I make them private. Um, but it's amazing to me how many people still have no fear of God and mock him on a continual basis. And I, I don't get angry at those people. I get sad for them. They have no clue what they're doing. They don't know the king that I know. And they're mocking the Lord and they say some of the most vile, evil wretched things. But we see the same thing here. And then they clothe him in purple. Now understand, this is probably an old faded military garment because in Matthew it describes it as being scarlet in color. Again, one of those so-called contradictions. Well, this is what would happen, and they know this from recorded history, is these scarlet garments, which were dress garments for the soldiers, a lot of times they would fade, and after a while they would look purple. And so what is going on is they take an old, dirty, faded, scarlet garment that looks purple because they know purple is the color of royalty and it looks purple enough to where they're going to throw it on Jesus and mock him. Oh, you're royalty? Here's your purple garment. And of course, a king needs a crown. So they make together this makeshift crown and most likely it's from the jujuba tree, which is 15 to 20 feet tall. And they're, they're these long branches with thorns, but the thorns were, were strange because there was a straight spike and a curved spike together. And so they make this, this crown, this Stephanos, this, this crown, and they place it on our Lord's head, and they shove it into his forehead. And you know how much, if you've ever had a, a cut on your head, it's one of the, the areas of the body that bleed horribly. And so more blood is coming down his face. And what do they do? They're laughing, obviously. They're mocking, and they salute him. And they, they say, Hail, King of the Jews, because they know that is the crime he's convicted of. That's, he's there because supposedly he's claimed he is the King of the Jews. And so they're mocking him. Verse 19 again, Then they struck him on the head with the reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And so they strike him with a reed. Most likely that was their fake scepter. They're striking him on the head. But I want us to understand, we know that Jesus in chapter 10 of Mark, he already told his disciples that he was going to be mocked, that he was going to be spit upon. But now we're looking at, this is hundreds of soldiers. Now, I don't know how many are actually doing the beating and the spitting, but understand the, the phrase here where it says that they spat on him. This is a different word. It means continual spitting. They didn't stop. They just kept spitting on our Lord as they're beating him and mocking him. Charles Spurgeon has a famous quote about these events. He says this, See that scarlet robe? It is a contemptuous imitation of the imperial purple that a king wears. See above all, that crown upon his head? It has rubies in it, but those rubies are composed by his own blood. They are forced from his blessed temples by the cruel thorns. See, they pay him homage, but their homage is their own filthy spittle, which runs down his cheeks. They bow the knee before him, but it is only in mockery. They salute him with the cry, Hail, King of the Jews, but it is done in scorn. Was there ever a grief like his? And what I think about, and I can't help but think about, is what happened to these men who were doing this when they breathed their last breath on earth. Those who mocked him and spit on him. And I can't help but think about the passage in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every 
knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They mocked Jesus that day in false worship. They mocked him in false worship. But when they took their last breath in this life, unless they came to Christ, which is always a possibility, but those who didn't and those who mocked him and spit on him that day, when they opened their eyes in heaven, just imagine the horror and the fear when they realized who they were standing in front of, the one they mocked, the one they spit on. You know, I told you in my flesh, it almost, and I'm like, yeah, that's right. But the Lord would say, no, that's not the spirit we're of. The Lord would say, I died for them too. <laughs> that's always hard to remember. When, when people bug you, when people rub you the wrong way, it's hard to remember that Jesus died for them too. <laughs> or am I alone in this, you know? I told you when I'm going to get cut off in traffic, I'm like, well, that person's not a Christian, you know? <laughs> but the truth is he died for all of us. He died for everyone. He died for even those who spit on him. <laughs> That's just powerful. But these men, they bowed in mockery. And eventually we know they probably bowed in complete fear. But Listen to this. In John uh, chapter 19, we read this because Pilate, he's still trying to rescue Jesus somehow. He doesn't want to crucify Jesus. Look at this. In John 19, verse 4 and 5, Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And, uh, purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. This is that famous uh, statement in Latin. Ecce homo. You've probably seen the plays or the Passion of the Christ or the movie. Behold the man. He's been scourged. He's sliced. He's bleeding. He's covered in this faded robe. He's wearing this crown of thorns. It must have been a horrible sight. He brings him out and says, Is this what you wanted? Behold the man. Because he's still trying to escape having to crucify Jesus. But then we read, we know they continued to call for Jesus to be crucified. The second part of verse 6 of that same chapter says, Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. They know what they're doing. They're killing someone who claimed to be the son of God. Verse 8, therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. I'm sure he was. And went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? Could you imagine what's going through Pilate's mind? They're calling this guy the son of God? Who is this guy? He's like no one I've ever met. Who is he? But it says Jesus gave him no answer. And this is where Pilate famously tells him, answer me, do you know I have the power to crucify you or to set you free? But in verses 11 and 12, Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivers me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Understand Pilate's condition. Sejanus was the leader of the Praetorian Guard. He was a very powerful leader in Rome. He helped get Pilate this position after Pilate had done some mess-ups of his own. But this guy, Sejanus, was very powerful. The Praetorian Guard was the special forces. They were the ones who guarded the emperor. They were the ones who guarded the elite. They were the ones who guarded generals. They guarded all the important people of Rome. And they were the ones who were a staunch ally with Pilate. Sejanus was the leader of this group. But in 31 AD, this is what happened. Sejanus was accused of sedition. He was executed along with several of his men for rebelling in Rome. And Pilate lost his, his trump card, so to speak. Because Pilate had always relied on the power of Sejanus and on his intimidation and on all of the power that he had. Not only that, but that Pilate had gotten himself in trouble after those executions. When he was vulnerable, he had caused several rebellions within Judea, and Rome had warned him, one more and it's your head or it's your job. Pilate was walking on thin ice. So when they accuse him of doing this, this is a credible threat. When, when they say, if you let this man go, 
you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. But again, Pilate had a choice, but he chose his own life. He chose his own comfort because he knew what would happen if one more report went to Rome. But then we read in verse 20, they took this purple garment off of him. And if you know how blood works, if you ever used a bandage that wasn't like a regular band-aid or anything, but just bandages on a wound, and it coagulates and adheres to the wound. So think about that garment and what it would have done. I don't have to go into detail, but then they rip it off of him. And they put him back in his own clothes. And then something profound happens on the way to Calvary. Mark 15, verse 21. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. Tradition tells us that Christ fell beneath the weight of the cross. And when you think about this, you know, I don't want to ruin anybody's image <laughs> of what, what occurred that day, but they didn't carry the full cross. The full cross was over 300 pounds. It was in place. It was ready for those being crucified. What they carried was the cross beam. So they would carry the cross beam, which was usually 75 to 100 pounds. And then they would put the sign around the neck of the criminal with the charges against them that they've been found guilty of. And we know that same sign would then be placed above their head. And that's the sign we know our Lord would have also placed above his head. So here he is in this weakened condition. And most likely he'd been up for over 24 hours. He had lost a lot of blood. He'd been beaten. He'd been spat on. He'd been mocked. All of these things he'd gone through, not to mention the Garden of Gethsemane, he bleeding great drops of blood in the agony and the stress of understanding that the cup of God's wrath was going to be poured out on him. He has gone through all this. He's in weakened condition. He can't carry the weight of the cross. And he falls to the ground. But something beautiful is about to happen. But before I get to that beautiful picture, I want us to understand this. This man, Simon, it tells us that he had sons, Alexander and Rufus. And the way that's listed, we understand in early church history, they would have been known to those reading. And this is what I love about Scripture, because we know in, there is some evidence in the Scripture of all of their family coming to Christ, Simon and his sons, and even his wife. But most of that we know from church tradition. Simon and his two boys certainly became Christians. We also know in Romans 16 that Paul mentions Rufus in Romans 16 and his mother, which is most likely the wife of Simon. But understand, he's from Cyrene. This is in North Africa. That would be Tripoli, Libya, that general area. And we know there was a large contingent of Jews in that region. We know that from Acts chapter 2. When you look at the, the episode of Pentecost, one of the groups of devout Jewish men that were there listening were from Cyrene. They were these Jewish men from Cyrene. And in Acts chapter 11, when you study this out, you realize the church started to flourish in that same region, most likely because of someone like Simon. It flourished. And then in Acts 13, we see some of the leadership of that church in Cyrene. And so this is just an amazing thing when you think about it, that Simon and his sons become believers. But some, when they look at this, they might say, well, the, this is kind of hypocritical. This is contradiction because how is it the Lord tells us that we're to pick up our cross and follow him, but then he couldn't even carry his own cross? What's going on here? And I tell you, this is actually something very beautiful and something profound and something very freeing when you embrace it and you understand what's going on here. Simon is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. We are to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, but we are also to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we can't do the Christian walk on our own. We can't carry our cross. We are commanded to pick up our cross and carry it, but if the Lord couldn't carry it, he doesn't expect you to carry it. And understand this, the cross the Lord carried wasn't even his to bear. The cross he was carrying was yours. And he collapsed under the weight of it all. It crushed him under the weight. It, it forces each one of us to do the same thing, to fall to our knees and surrender and say, I can't do it. You can't do it. We were never meant to do the Christian life alone. He said, I'm sending you a comforter. I'm sending you a helper. The triune nature of our God is so remarkable because do you understand as you're seeing this beautiful picture here, we can look forward to after the cross and understand in that same chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 2, 
at Pentecost when the Spirit is given and the church is born. And we understand that every believer, when you're born again, you're filled with the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God. I, I've, Romans chapter 8 is such a profound chapter. But when you study it out, it, sa- it tells you and me. It's a beautiful picture of the Trinity, the triune nature of God, and mankind. And it tells us we're not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. For the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body's dead because of sin. But your spirit's in life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through the Spirit that dwells in you. And when you go study that out, it's a profound picture of the triune nature of God interacting with human beings. And this beautiful picture of Simon, the Cyrene, he is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. Jesus couldn't carry his cross up Golgotha because it's a picture for you and me. We were not intended to carry it alone. We're to carry, we're to pick up the cross and follow him, but we can't do it alone. And we know this, though. We know that Jesus made it to his destination. Our last verse for today, Mark 15, 22. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. It's also translated, and I think it's a better translation, place of the skull. I'm not going to go into this today, um, but it's a profound thing when you study this out, what Golgotha is all about, because it's not only a beautiful and amazing thing for all of us, it's an amazing thing for Israel, and it's an amazing place for God himself. I might touch on some of that next week. But here's the thing. Uh, sometimes I get asked about the name of this church, Golgotha. Well, why would you name it that? It means place of the skull. And I said, well, the, the Latin word calvea, it, it means the same thing. It's where we get our word calvary. I guess it just sounds a little more, you know, <laughs> a little more palatable. But, you know, when we were praying about this church plant, God gave me a passage out of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Um, you can study that out on your own. And something just clicked one day, and I was praying, and, the, and I realized the Hebrew name for calvary is Golgotha. And so that's why you know, it's no great mystery. I had an email recently. Somebody, they're not even from here. They said, hey, by the way, why is your name Golgotha? It means place of the skull. So I sent them the information. And they're like, oh, well, that's a good answer. Thank you. Have a great life. <laughs> I, was there. I was like, oh, all right. Praise God. <laughs> but I just love the fact that our Lord went to the apex of Calvary, to that summit of Golgotha willingly, and he did it for the joy that was set before him. You're the joy that was set before him. You and I are the joy that was set before him. That's how much he loves you and me. The cross of Calvary is the greatest love letter that's ever been written. And I just want to finish with this. I want us to be encouraged to do that, to do the very thing that our Lord did, to pick up our cross and follow him. But I want to read to you out of the Amplified Version, the classic Amplified Version, because it's a sermon in and of itself. And you're going to see that. Uh, You're like, I got two sermons today, or three or four, or whatever, how many I preach. But let me read this to you. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 27 in the classic amplified version says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside selfish interests, and take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. And follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living and, if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. For whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses his life in this world for my sake will find it, that is, life with me for all eternity. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, wealth, fame, success, but forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory and majesty of his Father with his angels. And then he will repay each one in accordance with what he has done. I told you, that's kind of just a sermon in and of itself, isn't it? But here's the thing. The Lord would never ask you to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself. The Lord picked up his cross. The Lord died to himself. The Lord did the will of the Father. And as I said earlier today, you can't do it alone. You need to look to Jesus. You need to be led by the Spirit. And you're not promised it'll be easy. But we are certainly promised that it's going to be worth it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the cross. 
And thank you for sending your only son to die for us, Lord. And Lord Jesus, thank you for looking beyond the shame and the torture of the cross and all the brutality and looking at the joy that was set before you. Lord, help us to do the same. Help us to look past all the difficulties, all the issues of this life, and help us to look forward to an eternal glory with you, a beautiful future, Lord, that we can't comprehend now, not this side of eternity. And what I know is this, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, but it matters on which side of eternity we do that. And so, Lord, we praise you, we honor you, and as we enter into this time of communion, let our hearts be made right and let us be renewed and refreshed in you. In Jesus' name, amen.